education, health care, economics, um, what have I forgotten, uh, health care, and trying to make this world a better place, trying to use what we know in our heart we need to do for all people. Um, Olivia has been in Rochester for almost two years. She is a native New Hampshire. She studied political science and would you believe Chinese. And Olivia, you said you've been to China. Been to China. And and you can speak some Chinese, right? Awesome. Huh? A bit not. Yeah, well, when you don't use it, you lose it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, Olivia and the Isaiah people yesterday had a most awesome educational forum. Oh, it was just awesome. I don't know how many people. How many people were there, Olivia? It must have been 100, 175. Yeah. So, um, anyway, without any more talk, Olivia. small room, I think that might help the people who are listening online to hear. Thank you, Kathy. And good to see you all. Is this not the most gorgeous weekend we've had in a very long time? So thanks for being with me here, and then let's all go have you know, a wonderful uh, rest of our day outside. So Kathy introduced me as the organizer, community organizer here locally in the Rochester area with Isaiah. And Isaiah is a home for people of faith and shared values working for racial, economic, and climate justice in Minnesota. So we organize both within faith institutions and also folks who are not necessarily people of faith, but that's where our roots are. Isaiah was founded in 2000, and our name comes from the book of Isaiah, verse 58, 12, you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. So we started kind of as a collective of churches in the metro area and in St. Cloud who wanted to try to think about how could we approach social justice in a more systemic way. Um, a lot of churches do fantastic work, faith institutions generally do fantastic direct service work, healing some of the challenges and problems that we have in our society and meeting people's immediate needs, and that is so important. But a lot of our ethos is thinking about what are the systems and structures that lead people to be housing insecure or economically insecure or food insecure or to be struggling to get the health care that they need. There are a lot of systems and structures that we live within that we might feel like we don't have much of a voice in or how could we possibly change those things? The problems are so big. But that's our mission, is to think about how can we be deciders in our democracy? Our democracy is about us. How do we play a role to change the systems that are harming us and the people that we love? So our organization, like I said, started 24 years ago or so um, out of Christian faith institutions. And we've grown and we've diversified a lot. So we aim to realize a few things in Minnesota and in our local communities. We want to realize a caring economy where everyone can thrive, a multiracial democracy where everyone's voice is heard, and a just climate future so that we have a planet that's healthy that we all can be on together. And we have what we call an, a number of different rooms of the house. So faith congregations across the state are a big part of our movement, but we also have a lot of other rooms that have developed over the past 24 years. Uh, we have a really strong and powerful Muslim coalition organizing in mosques across the state. We have a young adult coalition, a rural organizing project, which is our newest uh, kind of initiative that organizes in rural townships all over Minnesota. Kids Count on Us is our child care organizing project of over 500 independent child care centers advocating for what families and child care educators need. And we have a barbershop and black congregational cooperative, which is mostly in the metro area. So all together, we have lots of different things that we're working on and interests, but we come together around kind of, this is our North Star of what are some of the things that we're advocating for. So we're values-based, we're a nonpartisan organization. Nonpartisan though doesn't mean neutral. It doesn't mean that we don't have clear values that we stand for. 
It means that we think that there is more out there than just one candidate, one politician, one party, and that we have our North Star are these issues, and how can we work to advance those with whoever will work with us. So let's talk about a little bit of what we do. And I wanna to say too, I think we'll have like some time at the end for questions, but I, I encourage you to ask questions throughout because that's what I'm here for today. Yes? Can I just clarify that bottom? Sure. What about faith in Minnesota? How, what's the connection there? Yeah, great question. So Isaiah is our 501c3 nonprofit, and that's been around since 2000. We do like issue advocacy through that lens, and so that's where a lot of our faith institution work happens. Faith in Minnesota, we formed in 2017 because we realized like, we're doing a lot of lobbying and advocacy on issues, but we realized if we're not involved in elections, we're leaving a lot of power and influence on the table. So we formed uh, Faith in Minnesota, which is our 501c4, and we do more direct like electoral elections work through that aim. But that doesn't involve our faith institutions directly because they're not permitted to do that kind of work. Thank you. So, what kind of stuff do we work on? Um, first, so I have some handouts at the front if y'all want to take a look, and some of you have them in your hands already. But I wanted to look back a little bit to last year and kind of take you through the journey to where we are now. In 2023, in the winter and spring, we had a state legislative uh, session in Minnesota where a lot of new policies and budgets got passed. A lot got done last legislative session. And we were played a big role in that. We had been working on many of the things that had been passed last year for between five to 20 years. So it was really exciting to finally see some of that groundwork we had laid for a long time be realized. Um, who is familiar with what are some things that passed last year in Minnesota that maybe you were excited about or knew about? Pay family and medical leave, yes. So PFML, paid family and medical leave, paid time to care for all workers in Minnesota. So if you have a new child, if you're caring for an ailing spouse or parent or child, um, you have time to do that at, at partial pay, guaranteed to all workers in Minnesota, and that's going to start in 2026. About 11 other states have done that before Minnesota, and finally we are gonna do that here too. Yeah, driver's licenses for all passed last year, also something we worked on for a long time, so that anyone in Minnesota, regardless of your immigration status, can be safely qualified to drive. This is really important so that folks can get to work, to school, to church. Like in a community like ours, everybody needs, almost everybody needs to be able to drive to get somewhere safely, and it's kind of a question of, are they qualified legally to drive, or are they driving without that qualification? So that was really important. Free lunch and breakfast. Free lunch and breakfast for all students, yes. So every student in Minnesota now doesn't have to worry about like going to school hungry. Um, they get breakfast and lunch if they need that at school, and that was really exciting to me as well. That's gonna improve learning outcomes dramatically. One more. So you still have to, in order to get a driver's license, you need to pass a uh, written and a road test. I know I had to do that when I moved to Minnesota just a couple years ago. So that's something that all drivers still need to pass in order to be qualified legally to drive. Yeah. Is there additional funding for students? From last year's session, yes. Yeah, there was an increase in education funding last year. And also going forward, it's gonna be tied to inflation, which is a badly needed because for many years it hasn't been in Minnesota. Did Isaiah have anything to do with that? Yeah, we've advocated for like expanded revenue for okay. education and child care for many years. So and that's something that especially locally, like Kathy mentioned, we had this huge event yesterday around school funding. This is something that's really important to us. And there's more. More that needs to be done. We haven't solved everything, right? So let's talk about where we're going. Um, this is I, I guess just a quick review of some of the things we passed in 2023. Um, some things that weren't mentioned were some, like the Democracy for the People Act and voting rights restoration for folks who were previously incarcerated. That was something that we worked on for 20 years to finally get done. Um, so folks who are living in our community 
sometimes are on felony probation or parole for 15, 20 years, and they were not permitted to vote, even though they're living in our communities, working, going to church, right? But now they're actually able to have a voice in our democracy again. 100% um, clean energy by 2040, this is some nation-leading policy that Minnesota is taking responsibility for the climate crisis. Uh, lots of child care funding, this is a big deal because anyone who has interacted with the child care system recently knows that the system is just really not working. It's very unaffordable for families and educators, child care educators, do such important work and are not being paid at the level they need to be. So these are things that we're still advancing. Um, well, these, all of these have been passed and then what are we able to, to build on uh, related to this work? So what's happening next? After the legislative session last year, we were in a position, as Isaiah, where, like I said, we passed things we've been working on for five years up to a couple decades, and we were in this position where our agenda, we had crossed everything off. So we're thinking, what do we do next? This is an exciting moment. Like, how do we define what are people still struggling with, concerned about, want to see be different, and, and what are they hopeful for? So we went through a listening campaign process across the state and including here in the Rochester area to hear what are people worried about, what keeps them up at night, what do they love most about our community, what could we make even better. So we had these one-to-one -one conversations or small group conversations with 500 people all across our community and it was, I don't know, I think like 6,000 or something across the state to write an agenda for Rochester of what are some of the issues that people most want to see be different. And we came together around, I have a, on the handouts in the front, I have a listing of kind of the five top areas, but those included housing, youth, like our next generation, community building, healthcare, and climate and sustainability. So those are kind of our North Star of what we're working on now in our local area. It's exciting that in Rochester, we've Isaiah has been around Rochester since about 2019, so we're a relatively newer base of the organization. Uh, this is the first time that we wrote our own agenda of what we want to work on locally. And that education being one of the issues that we're especially focused on here. So we're working on education, on healthcare, on housing and climate right now. What we did was we took that agenda, which had big ideas like everyone in, in our community deserves a safe, affordable, dignified home, or every child in our education system deserves to be seen and understood and receive an excellent education. So those are like, those are big visions that we want, but we thought about, okay, how do we then clarify or crystallize that down to specific issue campaigns that we could launch and win maybe over like a year long timeline. So how can we get clearer about things we could do locally and at the state level to make those happen? So over the winter, leaders of Isaiah, and we call everyone in Isaiah as a leader because everyone has the ability to you know, affect change and be a desire. So leaders of Isaiah met with all of our city councilors, county board members, legislators, and school board members over the winter to find out what's already being done on these issues, like housing, like climate, like education. What's already being done? What could be possible? And how could we work together? So we had like 25 of those visits, and we even met with some non-electeds, like we met with the Housing Coalition locally, we met with Dave Dunn at the county, who's Housing and Planning Director. And out of those visits, have developed these areas that we're focusing on. So for healthcare, that's something we're working on more at the state level around healthcare fairness and uh, access and uh, affordability. So the public option, Minnesota Care public option, is something we're advocating for strongly at the legislature to expand Minnesota Care public health insurance to 150,000 more people. On education, we're advocating for school funding because we know our schools here in Rochester really need that. We were active in the referendum campaign last year trying to get that passed and that was a heartbreaker for us, having a close result, but we're determined to think about how do we continue to engage more of the community and get people together around a common vision of what our schools can be. And we had this fantastic event yesterday of 175 people at Mayo High School who wanted to come and engage and like think about how we make that possible together, and it was really inspiring. And then housing and climate, we're working on some state level 
issues like zoning uh, changes at the state level that would make it easier to build more housing in more different places. Uh, and then we're also thinking about locally a county housing plan to encourage Olmstead County, which is doing fantastic work on housing, to be doing even more. We want to build the public support to keep like boosting their efforts to make sure they have the, uh, what's the name? I'm not sure if I accidentally turned this off or it did. Hi. Do I need to press? Thank you. Yeah. So like thinking about, oh my gosh, how has our education changed in terms of like things that are maybe better than the past, but also things that we've lost that we that used to be offered. I know that it really bothers me that I got a fantastic public school education. The town I grew up in, I was really privileged that like people lived there because the schools were so great. And like uh, Kathy mentioned, I studied, I studied Mandarin. I got a graduate degree in Chinese studies. And I never would have done that if I didn't have the opportunity to study Chinese starting in high school. I started doing that, and that like changed my entire life. Um, I lived in China because I had that opportunity. And students in Rochester Public Schools can't don't get to study Mandarin. That isn't an option for them. Um, and so, you know, I think about, wow, I want kids to have even more opportunities than I had when I was growing up. And it bothers me if they don't. So thank you all for kind of sharing that and continue to share and ask questions. Talking, I want to share a little bit about um, what our what some of our priorities or bills are that we're working on at the state level this session. So big legislative session last year in 2023, and this is the second year of the biennium. Um, can anyone tell me what's the difference between this year's legislative session and last year's? Sorry. Yeah, funding. So last year it was a budget year. So that's when the state budget is set. Basically, any kind of like state policies or programs that require money to you know like to implement are passed during a budget year generally. And then the off year or I guess the even year, so 2024 is a bonding or policy year. So there's sometimes a small supplemental budget, like there has been a small one this year, but it's nowhere near the, the scope of something that like happened last year. And last year was also an anomaly because of this surplus that we had in Minnesota that we're not necessarily gonna have in the future. But so this year, a lot of our, um, what we're, we were advocating for are programs that don't necessarily cost money or are programs that are important enough to us that we wanted to be a funding priority for any funding that might be available this year. So I mentioned the healthcare public option, expanding Minnesota care coverage is a big priority of ours. Minnesota care is a really unique and popular program in Minnesota for folks who make a little bit too much for medical assistance, but still health insurance on the marketplace, I can say from personal experience, is very expensive if you don't have access to good health insurance through a job, for example. 
Um, we're, we're advocating for a new uh, Minnesota um, commission for on equity in healthcare that wants to look into how state dollars are being spent on healthcare because we all know this is an extremely expensive industry and a lot of people are making a lot of money off of our healthcare. And where, like, how are we going to make sure our healthcare system is people-centered instead of profit-centered is something that's a, a big question for us. And so where are state dollars going around healthcare? And how can we make sure everyone gets access to the care they need? Because like our rural organizing project knows that folks in some parts of Minnesota are driving three hours just to go to a regular clinic appointment, or they have to go out of state to get their health care because there's nothing nearby. So how do we make sure we have equitable access? Um, debt fairness, especially around medical debt, is also something we're working on this year. Something that I learned recently is that medical debt is one of the only kinds of debt that can be transferred to a spouse after someone's death. So if someone has a terminal illness, like a cancer diagnosis, dies after extensive treatment, they might have hundreds of thousands of dollars in bills and debt that is then transferred automatically to their spouse. And that isn't true of most other kinds of consumer debt. And that's really unfair because medical debt is not something that people choose to take on or want to take on. It's, you know, and it's not also not a, an indication of someone's creditworthiness generally because it's not a choice that they make. It's something that just happens to them. Um, around housing, we've been advocating, like I said, for zoning changes to be able to build more housing, more places. There are a lot of, um, it's, we build a lot in Minnesota. We build a lot of single family homes and we build a lot of large multifamily apartment buildings, but not much kind of in between. Kinds of homes like townhomes or twin homes or triplexes. And in a lot of communities, it's illegal to, to build that kind of housing. Even if you want to, you have a property and you want to build that, it's illegal to do so. So trying to make, trying to actually like deregulate in a way to be able to build more housing in more places where they want to. And there was, unfortunately, a lot of that bill is dead for this year. It had a really interesting coalition behind it of group, like faith-based groups like Isaiah and Beacon Interfaith Housing Collaborative up in the Metro supported it. Environmental groups like Sierra Club, Move Minnesota, but also um, like economic groups like the Chamber of Commerce, the Minnesota Realtors Association, the Builders Association, all supported this for varying interest reasons because we're all seeing like this, we need to build a lot more housing and so how do we actually make it legal to do that? On climate, we're advocating for thermal energy networks pilots um, to get to 100% clean energy by 2040. We need to think about how are we connecting more commercial properties, more residential properties to clean energy networks. So there's some pilots. Uh, that seems to be moving forward this session, which is exciting. On child care, our vision is for families to pay no more than 7% of their income on child care which is nowhere close to where we are right now. If you were a family with one infant in childcare, you would have to make over, I think, like $250,000 to have no more than 7% of your income go towards childcare. So this is this scholarship program would not have gotten us that far, but would get us closer. But unfortunately, that is that was not prioritized in the budget this year. So that's something we'll have to come back for next year. And we've been doing some work around continued democracy expansion. Like there is a bill, I think it's looking good to move forward this year to require uh, polling places to be available on college campuses. This is true in some places, but not all. So being able for students to be able to have access to vote, they're choosing to vote uh, where they're going to school. So that's one example of ways that we're trying to expand voting access to as many people as possible. Any other questions so far about Things we're working on or where things are, sure. So one of my um, nephews who has uh, got different ideas than I do, uh, posted on Facebook uh, that we are Demo uh, Dem Democratic Republic, and then they focused on the Republic. Um, and I argued, yes, we are Democratic Republic, not an authoritarian republic. So uh, a lot of people don't understand what these terms are. You know, democratic, they think the Democratic Party. And when they hear the word republic, they think the Republican Party, which was exactly where he was going with this post. And uh, so what is Isaiah doing for uh, community education? Sure. Um, I like that you named that. How many other, I mean, actually, I didn't do a temperature of the room at the beginning, but how many people 
in 2024 right now are kind of a little worried about the state of our democracy and the political landscape generally right now. Over to my own time. Yeah, so like thanks for naming that. People, there is a lot of conflict and stress and tension around what does it mean to be a Minnesotan? What does it mean to be an American? What is what are our shared like collective values around the way that we exercise democracy? For us, it's all about like democracy is the heart of everything that we do and it's about everyday people being desires in our political system. So definitely, I mean, resist the idea that, the idea of an authoritarian style of government where only people at the top get to make decisions or there's just a few people who have all the answers. That's very much against our ethos and like both in the way that we do things and what we advocate for. Like in our democracy, like some of this is literal, like in our democracy expansion legislation, how do we make it so that more people can participate in the process? And sometimes that's voting, sometimes that's like public engagement and opportunities for people to publicly comment. Sometimes it's the way like districts are drawn so that people can be represented as fairly as possible. So that's some of the work that we do, but it's also woven like into all of this, that we all deserve to have a voice, that we deserve to be heard, because we are told this story by like our culture that we like any one of us is like too small really to be able to do anything that a lot of us kind of when we feel that fear or like tension around the state of our democracy today sometimes i know i feel tempted to despair or be numb to it or withdraw from the process and there are what well, something that we mean very clearly is there are, there are a lot of interests in our country who benefit strongly from that they want us to have that reaction so that we don't get involved and challenge it. And it's often folks with a lot of money, it's folks with a lot of power already, who want us to feel that way so that we don't engage. And that's something that we actively, yeah, educate and resist on. And I'm glad you asked that so I could say that clearly. that we've been involved. We've talked about this big forum we had yesterday on education funding and how we come together around our schools. Other examples of how we take action are we have we had some big lobby days at the Capitol on some of these issues. We host other events in the community. We host forums like these and faith institutions. Uh, we worked on the referendum last year, like I said, and talked to people on the phones at public events about why it matters that we support our public schools. We've done things like last year, we advocated the city council for um, greater sustainability funding. We also uh, advocated against the city council's recently passed ban on camping um, in public parks and spaces, which we saw as just kind of a punitive approach for folks experiencing homelessness that doesn't really address the, the problems that they're facing that leave them to be housing insecure. So there's lots of things we do at the local and state level and exciting, exciting ways to get involved. Essentially, I know a lot of folks in the room like probably share some of the values that we talked about today. Or you see the agenda that we have for Rochester and think, yeah, I, I really like some of these ideas. And what we do is like the reality is that an agenda is words on a page unless we decide to take action and say, this is how we want to shape our community to be more like this, and what can we do together? Because it's a lot easier to do it together than just be out there on our own. How can we shape this together? And that's like the exciting and scary thing about people power is that it comes down to each of us and what role we want to play. Actually, I might pick on Kathy. Kathy has been involved with Isaiah a lot over the past year. What has that been like for you, Kathy, and what have you gotten out of it or learned from it? I'm invigorated. <laughs> I'm invigorated. I still keep thinking. No matter how young, how old you are, we are a family. And when we're a family, we care about every single person. And we don't, we don't want to be quiet. We want to explore and we want to have open conversations, I think. Like, Olivia, I'm wondering, what do you think our city, our council, our, our leaders, do you think 
we're they're on board. With what we're asking? Yes. Do you think they're on board? Um, it's a good question. We, I mean, our agenda. We've talked with, we've met with almost all the city councilors, board members, school board members, and I think there's a lot in common. I don't think that it's not realistic that you meet with an elected official and they say, "Yep, let's go ahead, let's do all of this." There's always, you know, that's why we need to specify how do we get to specific issue campaigns, negotiate. That's what we're in, uh, kind of for our housing and climate work right now. We're in this um, phase where we're thinking about what, um, how can we encourage the county to be doing more of the great work that it's already doing, like I said. So we're, we're setting some targets and saying, can Olmstead County double the number of housing units that it develops and owns? It has about 270 right now. They're really well managed. They're great housing for people that doesn't have to turn a profit. It's nonprofit housing so that folks can just have a place to live and it doesn't have to, like a lot of developers, like they need to b build in ways that make them a profit and that's because they're a business enterprise. But we know we need a lot more housing in our community and probably if we don't use the public funding to do that, it's not realistically gonna happen. So um, that's something we've been negotiating with county board members and like see some interesting potential for and are gonna keep talking about. So on that line, yeah. you say you've talked to the school board? Mm -hmm. Do you expect another referendum? Yeah, I think there's likely to be one. They haven't formally decided that yet, but they've been talking about it. And based on what the needs of the school district are now, if there is not another one and it doesn't pass, there will be dramatic cuts to the school budgets next year. Like, thank you to Mayo Clinic who made a, a sizable donation to the school district to kind of buy some time to keep things as they are, but there will be dramatic cuts. The mayor must have seen a need for that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like what Kirsten named that our whole community depends on a strong education system, and I think the you know, clinic saw that and wanted to intervene in that way. And you might think about how do we bring more and more stakeholders to the table to do that in a more consistent way instead of just like at the crisis point. Yes. I think uh, an issue that may illustrate things for me was when they told us they were going to tear up Soldier Field Golf Course in Rochester. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, a whole lot of people cared about something. And all this other stuff nobody said anything about. So you, I think you have to make it relevant to people. You say, hey, this school bond election is going to affect you, and here's how it's going to affect you. That might make a difference. Yeah. Or, or if you don't pay for our schools, we're going to tear up your golf course. <laughs> yeah, different, different funding streams, but it's interesting. I mean, it's, it is something I think we've been thinking about. We, I think as an organization, try as much as possible to have a hopeful vision, but it's true that like sometimes the fear of losing something is a motivator. And that's often why, you know, folks get organized in town is they, they're a little fearful of something changing. And like sometimes it's a good change, sometimes it's a bad change. So it all depends on what the issue is. but. Um, I think that's right, is for people to, to know how is this going to directly impact me, and that's a big part of how we think about that together, because if it's just, you know, again, a few folks in a room, whether it's school board members or even just like some leaders of Isaiah who really care about education, we need as many people in as possible to be able to make the best decisions collectively and to advocate in a way that the community re resonates for the community. You talked about how Isaiah is local and state oriented. Is right. there a national no. group or a national group similar? Um, I mean, there are other like faith based organizations that operate locally. Uh, we don't really do any national level work. We, we focus our work on state and local, and that's what we feel like we can impact most effectively. But um, I think there's a network called like PICO, P I C O. That I'm not, I'm not even sure what it stands for, but I know that there are a lot of organizations that do national or federal, federal level work that's rooted in folks' faith values too. So worth looking into. I'm just less connected to that. But we do, I mean, like share, like we do a lot of trainings with other organizations from other states, like one called the Ohio Organizing Collaborative. There's Faith in Indiana. You know, there's organizations that I've met people are connected to, like called Amos in Michigan that do similar work to what we do, and we think about how do we learn from each other, what are you working on that's been effective or not effective, and what can we learn from each other? Yeah. 
another education problem is. Um, Hang on, I just got one question for you. Yeah. Well, what is your support? And I mean, it takes volunteers, but it also takes staff to make sure that the volunteers are get what they need to you know, move forward. So, what is your yeah. support? Um, well, I'm a full-time staff member, so I'm a, yeah, I'm a full-time organizer. I'm on a team of, we have about 15 organizers across the state. I'm the sole one in Rochester. Um, but does that kind of answer your question? Yes. I mean, I just know that a lot of times volunteerism falls flat when there is a paid support. And yeah. That might be a need, too. Agree. Yeah. And that's something I think that we know, like, we talk about a lot, like, why do organizers have a job? It's because it's, it, some of this work, taking risks in public life is hard. And how do we support each other in that? How do we coach and mentor each other in that? That's a big part of my work is not, like, that's what I do as, a, as my vocation. It's not like, oh, yeah, I do all these things, and I, like, bring some people along with me. But I think about how am I empowering people to do all of this and lead this and coach them and support them in that so that they're also in, involving and inviting and developing other people. So it's like a snowflake of how do we grow our movement? And it doesn't all have to be like, you know, just me doing it out there, but us building a strong network of people who've been developed. And I agree entirely that that's important. Well, what I'm gonna do now is I think Kathy passed out some opportunities to take some next steps. I'd love if y'all signed, you know, signed in on that clipboard or hand me one of those. Those are some opportunities to get involved. Um, one of the, I guess some of the things that are on there of like things we can do today are a pretty simple one is to contact your legislators about some of the bills that I told you about. A lot of them, like a couple of them are moving, seem to be moving forward, but most of them need some more public support and pressure to be able to get done this session. The deadline of the end of session is May 20th. So things like the healthcare public option, some of the housing uh, zoning changes that we're advocating for um, are still, they might be down to the wire. It's like maybe May 18th or something is when they might get done, if at all. So contacting your legislator matters. And if you let me know that you're interested in that, I can send you more information about those bills and how to contact your senator or representative. Um, something that we do each week during the session, which I think is like a great just way to get started and find out what we're up to, is we have these Southern Minnesota Legislative Co-Government Zooms on Tuesdays from 7 to 8. And that's with six legislators from across Southern Minnesota, including three from the Rochester area. And we talk about different bills and focuses each week. This week it's about healthcare access, accountability, and medical debt. Last week we talked about um, well, we talked about two weeks ago, mental health, and I'm forgetting what we did last week. It's all a blur, but we've done, you know, transportation and housing and all these different issues. Uh, we have monthly meeting of Isaiah leaders uh, on the third Sunday of each month, the First Unitarian Universalist. So if you're curious about how could I be part of some of these teams, like working on health care or housing, climate, education, come join us at that uh, next Sunday at 5.30. And there's going to be a rally at the Capitol on Tuesday, May 7. We'll get some carpools organized, or maybe even maybe a bus if we have enough folks. We've done that before earlier this year. But if you're wanting to go up to the Capitol, if you've never been, it's kind of fun and exciting to advocate for those things at the end of the session. So those are some ways to get involved. And I'll end things there, but I'll still be around to answer questions and visit with you all. Thank you for being here.